Well, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to uh, another exciting event this evening with um, the IOSH Northeast of Scotland. Um, this uh, presentation this evening, or the discussion that we're going to have, is a slightly extended uh, version than normal. Um, and, I, and I really uh, I thank everybody for, for tuning in. We've, we've got uh, a large number of participants here today, so thank you very much for coming along. Um, so this evening, I'm going to be joined, uh, sorry, sorry, let me introduce myself first. I'm uh, Andy McNair. Um, I'm the chair for the, uh, the North East of Scotland branch, and I'm going to be co-hosted this evening by Kat Horsall. Kat, are you there? Yep, evening. Um, so as Andy says, I'm Kat Horsall. I'm the vice chair for the North East of Scotland branch. And we're also joined by Rachel. <clears throat> Hi, good evening everyone. I'm Rachel Hendron. I'm the comms coordinator for the IOSH Northeast of Scotland branch. Thanks, Rachel. So we've got Kat and, uh, Kat and Rachel. Kat and Rachel are going to help us um, with the, the co-hosting and, and some of the, the, the Q&A um, with the, with the panellists this evening. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to get straight into it. Um, tonight's event is uh, it's based, we, we, we entitled it The Science of Behavioural Safety, Methods in the Madness. Uh, I think we've got four uh, outstanding people, uh, experts in the, in the profession of uh, behavioral safety and, and culture change uh, who's come along and hopefully going to generate some, some good open debates uh, into what behavioral safety is all about, really. Um, so this evening, uh, we are joined by Tim Marsh. Now, Tim Marsh is the managing director at Anchor and Marsh. Tim, hello. How are you doing? Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Andy. How are you doing? You okay? I'm fine, thank you, I think. Well, thanks for joining us this evening, Tim. Um, Tim, can you just do a little quick introduction for yourself? Oh, right, sure. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody, or, or good evening, or good morning, uh, the nature of these things these days. Um, my name is Tim Marsh. Uh, I started with behavioural safety back in about 1993. Uh, running one of the uh, leaders of the UMIST, Manchester University Research into Behavioural Safety. Um, they'd heard about stuff going on in America, wanted to try it, so it was a research project funded by the HSE and over a period of three years. Uh, went well enough for a lot of commercial organisations to get in contact and say, uh, could you help us? Uh, and so spin-off organisations, myself, people like Dom Cooper were there at the same time. Um, and uh, from there, you, you, you quickly get into safety leadership, safety culture, and then just general cultural work. Um, so I spent the last 25 years doing that, really, um, around the world with quite a few organisations now, pushing 500, I think, over the 25 years or so. Fantastic. Thanks very much for that, Tim. Uh, secondly, on the panel this evening, we have uh, Duncan Aspin. Uh, Duncan Aspin is the head of HSEQS, for Volker Stebbin. So good evening, Duncan. Thanks for joining us. Good evening, Andy. How are you doing? I'm fantastic, thank you. Uh, and, and the same for you, really. Can you just do a, a sort of quick introduction? Yeah, as you said, I, I head up uh, HS Health Safety, Environment, Quality and Sustainability for Volker Stebbin, which is a marine and civil engineering organisation. Uh, I've worked in construction all my life. Uh, I've got an engineering background and really started to get into the safety side of it and then the behavioural side of it probably um, 15 years ago. In fact, I've never told Tim this, but he was the first person that I ever saw uh, presenting on this subject and, and he inspired me so much that I, I, I took it further and uh, very much passionate about a positive approach to behaviour change. I, I don't need to apologise then, Duncan. <laughs> and we'll wait and see, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> Duncan, thank you very much for that, uh, and, and, and welcome. Um, third on the panel this evening is going to be Bob Cummings. Uh, Bob Cummings is the CEO and the founder of Sodak Limited. So good evening, Bob. How are you? Good evening, Andy. I'm very good, thank you. Very good indeed. Good, good. Well, same with you. Thanks very much for joining us this evening. And again, Bob, can you just do a quick introduction? 
Uh, yes, of course. Uh, so yeah, now nowadays, um, head head up uh, a company called Sodak, which is um, we call ourselves a behavioural design agency up in Scotland. Uh, but before that, um, th I, my life was all spent in construction as well. Duncan and I go go way back. Um, I, I guess we got our uh, uh, cut our teeth in the same organisation in, in health and safety, and before that in engineering as well. And I too saw Tim, and I haven't told Tim this either, uh, in in Manchester. Chester when I was tasked with um, looking into some behavioral safety stuff when I worked for a company called um, Gleason um, actually after after my birthdays um, and yeah I was very impressed as well um, so thank you Tim. I started to feel old Tim or what? <laughs> <laughs> I, wish I, I wish I had taken some Grecian 2000 under the beard really. <laughs> Well, listen, thanks very much, Bob. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be an exciting event this evening. And last but not least, uh, we are joined by Dr. John Austin, uh, director and founder of Reaching Results. Uh, and, and John is actually joining us all the way from America. Um, Minnesota? Michigan. I knew it was one of the two. I knew it would begin with an M. <laughs> Well, welcome, John. Thanks very much. Um, again, if you can do, just do a quick introduction. Sure thing. Um, yeah, well, I'm really pleased to be here uh, with this esteemed group and uh, excited to talk today. I'm very honored to be invited and grateful. Um, so thank you. Um, I, um, I'm a behavioral psychologist and, um, you know, that usually makes me the, the, uh, the one that everyone stays away from at the dinner party, right? Um, <laughs> because I'm, they're afraid I'm going to ask them about their mom. Um, but um, so I got my PhD in behavioral science uh, some 30 years ago or so, uh, 25 years ago now. Um, and um, I was a professor for 15 years in, um, in behavioral science where I published probably 100 research papers that no one will ever read um, unless they're, you know, under duress or required to in a class. Um, and, uh, and so after some time doing that work and teaching um, lots and lots of students um, and, uh, and sort of really, really studying behavior, I, um, I wanted to um, help simplify it so that people, you know, in the world can use it. Um, so I figured, you know, we've got a great deal of behavioral science knowledge, but a whole, not a whole lot of it is simplified and simple enough to understand and to use every day. And so that's really been my mission for the last 10 years or so. Um, is to um, is to travel. I've you know I've taught thousands of leaders these uh, I think everyday simple concepts that are evidence based and science based uh, in twelve countries, and um, you know coached about ten thousand performance improvement projects over the years. So um, it's just what I love to do. I think a lot like Tim. That's kind of that's just been the thing that I've done uh, mm -hmm. for as long as I can remember. So. I'm pleased to be here. Thanks. Thanks, guys. No, well, thank you for joining us, John. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is our panelists for this evening. Um, although it's a webinar, I would actively encourage everybody, if you've got any questions, um, rather than putting the questions actually in the chat box itself, there is actually a separate area there for the Q&A. So please, if you do have any questions for the panelists this evening, um, type the questions in there, and it's going to be picked up by our co-hosts, uh, Kat and Rachel. So, well, good luck with this evening. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm actually going to take a, a back seat now and hand it over to the two co-hosts, which is Kat and Rachel. So thanks very much, gentlemen, and I'll catch you towards the end. Thank you. Okay, so um, we'll start with a, a nice, easy question for you all. Um, so we've all heard the term behavioral-based safety, uh, behavior safety, behavioral science, behavior change, culture chain, change, and there's many more. Um, could you clarify in your own opinions what exactly this means to you? And is it all the same? Is there a difference? And what is the science behind it? Okay, who's going to start? Who's that? <laughs> what was that? Sorry, Tim. Who's that first? Who's that two first? Who's... Whoever wants to tackle that question first can go for it. I'll go. Go for it, John. <laughs> go for it. I'm American. I'll be pushy. Um, the one with the funny accent starts. Um, so uh, I think that, um, you know, behavior-based safety, uh, from my perspective, you know, this evolved out of the science of behavior, right? 
Uh, and so the precursors are B.F. Skinner and his work and Og Lindsley and his work uh, at Harvard University. Um, and, uh, you know, although they were more basic researchers, they did some application work and stuff. The the, one of the earliest applications, uh, a lot of people don't know, of behavior-based safety was in 1972 um, with Fox, uh, Hopkins, and Anger. They ended up publishing that paper in like the 80s, so you can find it. I'm happy to supply you with the paper if you want to reach out. Um, I think it was 1986 or so, and it was applying it to open pit mining. Um, you know, soon after that, and really I think the people who codified, who like really laid out the protocol for behavior-based safety, uh, were two women, as a matter of fact. And uh, many people don't know that in the 70s, which was kind of even more rare than today. Uh, and that was Judy Komaki and Beth Solzer Azaroff. Um, and I've actually, um, I started kind of thinking about this for the purposes of this panel. And so I wanted to supply you guys with a couple of resources if you wanted to look more into this, um, including um, citing those original papers and also some other books from other women in, uh, in, in safety and behavioral safety. Um, as I dove into it more and more, I realized that there were some really high quality papers that a lot of people might not know about and a lot of books. So I'm gonna put a link for a free download in the, um, in the chat for that. Um, with a list of resources, but also uh, I published a paper some time ago now uh, with Beth Solzer Azaroff, one of the originators of the field, answering this question, what is BBS? So I'll give you a briefer answer, but like it's all in that paper from 2000 and I'll, and, uh, I'll put that in the, uh, in the chat as well. So that's going to you right there. You can get that in the chat if you'd like to uh, retrieve that paper. I'll put the other resource in there in just a minute. Um, just to, to sum up the answer here, um, I think that um, you know, mostly what we've seen from the science is that a behavior-based safety process starts with an assessment to figure out kind of what are the precursors to injuries and what are some of the conditions and behaviors that are leading to injuries. Uh, it involves some data collection and uh, defining those behaviors. And uh, that often results in like some sort of observation process. Uh, and then it really uh, involves some positive and corrective feedback, maybe verbal feedback, maybe graphic feedback, maybe both, and ideally some reinforcement and praise for improvement. And like those are pr pretty much the defining features of behavior-based safety. And uh, I want to let other, got other folks talk because, you know, there are other people on this panel who have lots of, lots of uh, input on this too. Um, but I'll, I'll just end by saying that you know, what we know about the research is the techniques that work, right? But what we don't always know is how to apply the techniques. So for example, right, like feedback. I can give Bob some feedback right now that goes well or that goes horribly, depending on how I say it, <laughs> right? Um, and uh, one, one version will work and one version won't work. The research does not really very well identify that. And so there are some studies, but like the bulk of the BBS research dating back to the 70s really doesn't address that stuff. So if the other panelists have some input on that, I'd love to talk about that today a little bit. John, can I just ask you, can I ask you a question really um, in terms of that? Because um, for reasons I'll talk about in a minute perhaps, uh, BBS particularly, behavioral based safety in the UK, I think has got a bit of a bad press. Um, and uh, Bob, has, uh, who's got a bit of experience of both in the UK and in the States, uh, suggests that there's some difference between the two. And, and so has, has uh, BBS got a bad press in, in, in the States or is it still very much alive and well? I, I missed the last part of your question. Could you please repeat the last Yeah, part? I was just saying, uh, f from your perspective, um, as, uh, as behavioral base safety, the, the BBS part of it, uh, is it still alive and well, or, or, or is it getting a, a bad press in the States as well? I think it's gotten a lot of bad press. Um, and I think it's become kind of commoditized because everyone thinks they know the steps, um, but they, they leave out the, the art of deploying them. Mm. That, that's where, that's where the, the, the bang for your buck is, I think. And that's where the major uh, improvements come from is, is in artfully deploying the, the techniques, right? So yeah. like we can get into like a lot of times in the US at least workers are blamed for injuries. And somehow that became part of the lore of like BBS, blaming people for their behavior. And that demonstrates to me that people don't really understand where the science came from at all because like mm -hmm. Skinner didn't even believe in free will. 
<laughs> right? let alone blame. Um, so like th that was never a part of it. Um, it's just, it became a little bit bastardized and kind of devolved into that. And, and in those cases, it's highly ineffective, I think. And so it got a bad name in many cases. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, I, I, and, uh, I, I think it's fair to say, I don't know whether the other panelists will agree with me, but uh, the BBS has got a, a bit of a bad press, uh, certainly in the UK. And uh, I suspect potentially it's because of some of the reasons you said there. It certainly was and has been commoditized. And um, my, my feeling on, on the way that uh, people approach the behavioral based safety is it's almost a, um, a one size fits all. So here's the solution. Now tell me what the problem is, you know, rather than working the other way around. And uh, it's very much been based around the ABC model, the antecedents, behaviors, and consequences, which of course come from, come from Skinner's operant conditioning uh, approach. But um, I think really there's been uh, a real emphasis on the, the consequences side of things. And I think I remember reading a paper once quite a long time ago from the TUC, the Trade Union Co uh, Congress. Well, I think it was titled something like... Um, the dangers of BBS uh, and, and the trade unions uh, were very much in, in the early stages against the, the behavioral based safety because they saw it as, as a way of really manipulating behaviors. And I think that's the way BBS has, uh, has come to be seen in terms of really focusing on the individual as the problem, uh, you know, the problem to fix and, uh, and really using kind of like coercive techniques in terms of trying to get the behaviors that people want. And uh, I think uh, Kat mentioned behavioral safety as well. And, and I think behavioral safety, and, and it's difficult to get the, 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 the difference between some of these sometimes, but I think if we take behavioral safety in a wider context, I think it looks more at uh, some of the other areas in terms of developing the right culture, developing the right leadership uh, as well to get that right environment. Uh, and, but from my perspective, I think behavioral safety even, it has two approaches. It has that top-down approach, which is definitely looking at the leadership and the, and the culture side of, of an organization. But it still does focus quite a lot on the, on the bottom-up approach. And again, looking at the, looking at the person, uh, uh, you, you know, the worker as being the problem and how we can uh, potentially manipulate that behavior. Uh, and, and for me, this is where really, um, and, and where the behavioral science side of things comes in and uh, and the behavior change side of things, which whilst a lot of what you described, John, on, on BBS certainly takes into the science, I think in the UK it may have lost some of that science, whereas there's a, a, a much more of a move towards behavioral science and behavior change now, which instead of looking at the individual is looking more at the environment around the individual. And uh, my personal definition on behavior change is it's understanding the influences on behavior and removing the barriers to change. And it is by understanding that environment that we, we can see that that's no longer looking at manipulating people's behavior, but really trying to create the environment where the desired behaviors can actually happen. And, uh, I, and I see a lot of positive moves towards that sort of approach now. I, I don't know, uh, Bob, what's your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, where, where to start with behavioral safety in the UK? I mean, I think it's all over the place and it still is. Um, at, least the, at least the US had a definition. Um, I think uh, you know, BBS, behavioral safety, are still not terms that are fully understood in, in the UK. And even, you know, you said there about behavioral science being um, maybe used a bit more. I, I'd like to think so, but I, I don't see much evidence of it. Um, so a bit of history where where kind of I came from into this I was I was working um, as head of health and safety for for a company and we'd been asked to go and find some stuff to do with behavioral safety because it started to be talked about if you like um, that's that's I did go and see see Tim one of Tim's lectures um, in uh, Manchester University and and it was very good it seemed to me at the time it was very much to do with nuclear the nuclear energy companies were doing a lot there certainly there was quite a few folk at that lecture from there went to see others ROSPA um, some other folk as well and there was also though a lot of dross out there and there was a lot of things you know this was this was round about the time of terminal five Heathrow terminal five stuff and um Lang uh were massively pushing behavioral safety but it was very much a worker orientated sheep dip kind of hearts and minds program 
um, that was accompanied by, um, you know, you've got the right to go home safe every day and these kind of things, um, which, which of course are, are okay, but they're not okay if that's the first thing you come out with. Um, and if that's the first thing you say without fixing ever, anything else. So to, to me, behavioral um, safety, and, and even when people called it BBS, I had no freaking idea what they were talking about, actually. Um, and then well, I was working for um, a large water uh, company in Scotland. Um, well, the only water company in Scotland, Scottish Water. So, um, and their construction site. And it was then that this company was working um, with them, but using behavioral science to improve forecasting. Nothing to do with health and safety, but because I was the head of health and safety and it had the word behavior in it, I was like, you know, give us, give us a shot of that, please. And found out it was all behavioral science that this company was teaching the project managers. And so we started to use that for um, some of the safety stuff as well, but it was not behavioral safety or, or BBS. It was behavioral science targeted to whatever you want. And that's, that's very much what I do now as well. Um, it's, it, we teach people behavioral science for whatever they want to use it for, um, whether that's quality, safety, whether it's leadership. Um, and it wasn't until I went to the States that uh, and got involved in a few conferences there that I realized that BBS and like the observation programs and other stuff that John's described there actually had a had a thing and I, I recently a couple well a couple of years ago went to Italy and BBS is massive in Italy would you would you believe um massive in the observational and peer-to-peer -peer observation programs and many of them have had lots of success in it when they've put a lot of effort into it but again it's very different from some of the stuff in the UK and, and actually, you know, it, it does break my heart a little bit to see some of the stuff we've got in the UK because it's just not up to standard. And I think, you know, just, and, and Tim can maybe back up and lead on from this in a second, but uh, John, some of that stuff that you referenced at the start, that is news to me. Um, I think it would probably be news to many people um, that there is actually, you know, a, a lot of work being done in this because a lot of the evidence in the UK is it's just mashed together of stuff that we've made up. Um, and it's not the stuff that you're talking about. Uh, so, so if you manage to grab those links that John sent out, then, then do definitely read up on it because there's something else out there that's called something similar that actually does make a difference. Yeah. Tim. Yeah. Th th thanks, Bob. Um, you know, I pick, picking up on the, on the criticisms, I know that the criticisms are quite severe in America and places and, uh, is it Rory McNeil wrote those articles that I think Duncan referred to. Um, and I think that reflects the fact that, you know, we know from just culture models that about 90% of what goes wrong is structural. It's uh, organizational, cultural. Um, and if you have a selection of methodologies, you really want to reflect that 90-10 split. So 10% of the individual, 90% of the culture and the organization. Um, and really, I think, you know, as, as you say, it's all over the place and there's a million versions now. Storytelling is having a run at the moment and, uh, you know, is, is, a, is a big thing. Um, but there are really three, three bands, really, for me, of, of be things that have flown under the behavioural banner. The first one is the classic inspirational piece, you know, uh, like, like my business partner, Jason. You know, uh, his early talks were, you know, I'm, you'll end up in a wheelchair like me if you're not careful, so be careful. Uh, very powerful talks, um, that certainly attract attention, but they're just to raise awareness really more than anything. Then there's a second strand, which I think uh, DuPont Stop, John, John Orman Sousa uh, represent, which is about observations. Uh, two strands to that. The first one is the old fashioned catch a person doing something right and praise them. Um, and uh, and all the benefits of, of you know that's 20 times as effective as criticism and, and the second one of course is the coaching conversation classically driven by a question like what if you know what if this happens what if that happens you know have you thought about the consequences of this and that's seeking a little kind of coaching style light bulb moment where people say oh no i hadn't thought of that i'll uh, i'll think on uh, and then the third strand i i think is really coming out of america uh decades ago now, um, driven, you know, by the likes of Scott Geller, uh, John, John himself, BST, uh, which you might call Six Sigma safety, kind of really reflecting the Deming model. Um, and that's got, in, which has got the measurement, goal setting, uh, analysis involved, and which is the model that, that attracted me as a, as a social scientist back in the day. Um, and then, and then uh, so those are the three strands that you, you would typically see. 
Um, the stuff that I'm trying to push at the moment is a much more holistic approach and saying, look, you know, we know we need a tailored approach. We know we need a tailored approach that mostly focuses on the organization. So you want a collection of methodologies picked and tailored to, to focus really on, on what is actually going wrong, but holistically, ideally. So it's a holistic approach to human error. That will certainly involve soft skills for the frontline supervisors. So I think John mentioned uh, poor quality feedback, but there are simple training issues like biff and biff off and, and that sort of thing, you know, um, that, that really help you give, give good feedback. Um, and they'll certainly want, uh, they might involve measurement, they might involve observations, but they'll certainly involve a lot of analysis. You know, so the classic book by Carol Dweck, I think I've got it right here, actually, Carol Dweck mindset. You know, the, 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 classic, the classic two questions, why did that happen? And now we understand why that's happening. What are we going to do about it? From the spirit of, uh, of analysis, um, I factor in some things that cause people to make mistakes like fatigue, mental health issues, uh, poor quality cultures, blame cultures. And, and you have a holistic approach to trying to identify whatever issue it is that we're trying to identify. Um, and obviously, I, I'm up for the holistic, integrated, tailored approach myself. Thanks very much there. Okay, so we've got a second question and we've also got some questions that have come in which link into this, so I'll, I'll group them together. So how do you make an impact on behaviour change within organisations to improve the overall culture and what are the key drivers to behaviour change? And the, the secondary parts to this are, do you believe businesses need a certain level of maturity before considering a BBS program and when is the right time to start a BBS journey as most organizations will use it as a tool rather than a way of life or a, a culture so if, if somebody would like to start with that well, one, please. Do you mind if I if I carry on and, and give you a case study and then I'll, Go ahead. I'll, I'll back off uh, a long time ago now um, previous century literally um, I did a case study uh, at a conference um, and we had two, I had two, two clients presenting with me. The first one was Shell uh, and they were talking about a process of a cultural improvement that they'd done that had primed them just ready to do a behavioural approach and the behavioural approach had been successful. And the second client was Chep UK, the, the pallet bashers, the blue pallets. Um, and when Shep, uh, Shell were talking, uh, they were laughing. So the first question they got when they st stood up was, well, why, why are you laughing? You know, why were you laughing at the shell guys? And they said, well, they were talking about levels of maturity. Well, we were down here somewhere. You know, it's laughable where we were. Um, but the story behind their success was that they killed somebody uh, in Avonmouth, I believe. And two of the senior um, management of the company, Neil Steeper and Vince McGurk, I think you remember, they were driving home from that. This is the middle of the 1990s. And said, well, we're not doing that again. That, that's, that's the last time we do that. So they a, a, a very aggressive approach to improving their safety. Everybody through an IOSH managing safety course, and and we'll go for that Welsh guy we saw at that conference in London. That was that was me, um, and they drove it through. Um, lots of pushback by the individual sites, as you can imagine, it's a pretty rough and ready industry. But they wouldn't have any of it. And they had a guy called Dave Fanning. He's, he's not with us anymore. Ex rugby league professional he was, and Dave was fantastic at following up management's instructions. Um, to, to local managers who were being obstructive. Um, he'd asked them very politely once. <laughs> and, but that, that management commitment drove through the change and they achieved fantastic results. Uh, you know, but for me, the, the absolute key thing is not where you are, it's the resolve to get where you need to be. And management commitment is, is absolutely key. Um, and, I, and I've picked that case study because I really want to say that I think the number one thing that improves frontline behaviour is good quality leadership which reflects a, a strong culture. That, 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 that's, that's my case study. So. Could I ju ju just um, add to that and um, possibly taking the supplementary question first, which I find quite interesting in terms of, you know, uh, does an organisation have to be at a certain cultural level before you actually start any sort of behavioural, I don't know, behavioural safety or behaviour change programme? And I must admit, uh, a good few years ago, I was uh, actually asked by one of the businesses I work for to implement a behavioral safety program. And at the time I said, uh, I'm not gonna do it. Uh, and and they, they said, why? I said, because we're nowhere ready uh, from, from a maturity point of view to, to actually make it work. Now, uh, in hindsight, uh, I, I would address that very differently now in terms of, for me, 
uh, in terms of having a behavioral safety or behavior change approach in an organization, part of that behavior change approach is to get the maturity right. So the, the, the time to start is now. You know, there's never, there's never a wrong time to start. Uh, and uh, absolutely following up on, on Tim's point there, obviously um, you need the environment right in the first place for any sort of behavioral safety or behavioral change approach to work. And therefore that leadership is absolutely essential in creating that right environment. Uh, because if it's not there, then any program that you actually start will only work for a short space of time and then it'll drop off and die. And, and, and I've personally seen this happen so many times where because there isn't the real belief in, in the approach uh, and really in the background managers and leaders doing what they always did, uh, but they believe they've got to have a behavioral safety program in place, then, then they never actually succeed. And then the time is spent later on in, uh, in actually putting a lot of pressure on people to, uh, to, to get results. And then you've really lost the, the whole point of why we were trying to achieve what we were trying to achieve in the first place. And, it, and leading on to that is, is the first part, part of the question, which um, what really impacts uh, in positive way behavioral safety. Uh, or, uh, and the biggest thing for me, and it really links back into this leadership thing, is trust. 100% trust. And uh, there's, a, there's a great book by, and I'm hopeless at quoting uh, authors, but I think it's Steve Covey, uh, and it's called The Speed of Trust. And uh, it's a brilliant book because it, that talks about the, the fact that you have to have trust in an organization and in your people to get to, to get the best out of the, out of the organization and to really move forward in an efficient way. Um, and because if you don't have trust, then you're stifled by uh, your, your process and procedure. Now, of course, process and procedure is important, but you, you don't want that to stifle you. You want it to support you. And by having trust in the people that work for you, you actually get... Um, you get people who actually can use their knowledge, their experience in what they do and do it on a day-to-day -day basis to really add into this. And this comes to this, the second part of really driving the, the, the influencing factors to do with behavioral safety. Um, and that is involvement and open ownership. Now to get involvement and ownership, you've got to have that trust in the first place. Uh, and it's about getting, uh, and I remember Tim saying this uh, when we were speaking a couple of weeks ago, actually, and it re really resonated with me. Um, and we're talking about experts. The experts are the people doing the job, you know, and, and, uh, and we need to be able to get the ownership and, and, uh, and engagement with the people that are doing the job because they're the experts. They do the work day in, day out, and therefore they know how it needs to be done. And by involving people in change, involving in ways of, new ways of doing things, then you get that ownership, you get the engagement because you, you own what you help to create. But that trust environment has to be there for people to feel as though they're comfortable to do that. Um, and uh, getting that trust and that engagement together, for me, is the biggest driver of any cultural change. I might be able to add something if that's okay. Um, I think there's, there's a lot of truth going on here. So take notes, everybody. I am. <laughs> it's really good answers. Um, you know, uh, I guess I contextualize this as, uh, you know, any results in your business are a product of the actions of people behavior. Okay. So don't think of behavior as having any value, good, bad, uh, no judgment, no blame. It's just the things that we do every day and the things that we say every day, those are, that's what creates your results, yeah? Well, uh, what drives that behavior? What drives the behavior is the environment that the, that the behaviors operate in. And that's everyone in the organization is in a specific environment that drives certain behaviors that they engage in, yeah? So, uh, and then who creates those environments? Leaders create the environments, yeah? Um, and we can say culture, that's just another word for saying, in my view, just that's another word for saying uh, it's the actions of people every day, right, uh, that create the environment that we operate in that drives our behavior, that drives our results. And so if you think about that, not just in safety, but in any results in your organization or in your family and personal life for that matter, it starts to simplify things a little bit, you know, it's suddenly the infinite becomes finite, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, there are many, many things that you can do to change the environment, but it's still just your focus is on the environment and how that impacts behavior. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is um, I agree uh, with Duncan's assessment on trust being super important. 
Um, and being a behavior, you know, behavioral guy, I, I kind of tend to want to put it into actions. And so if, uh, and I, I've done a little bit of that work. Uh, and so one of the terms that we talk about, Bob Cummins and I do, a, have talked about this quite a bit, is called behavioral integrity. And so behavioral integrity is doing what you say you're going to do. And that is the behavioral definition of trust building. Yeah. Like you, you say you're going to do something, you do it. People get evidence of that. Then they, then they come to trust you. Um, and some are trusting at the outset and they lose their trust when they see you not doing what they think you said you were going to do. Yeah. Um, but there's, there are other benefits aside from trust, right? Like um, if people perceive you as having high behavioral integrity, so you're very likely to do what you say you're going to do as a leader, they trust you more, but they also think you're more competent. And they're also more likely to go above and beyond when you ask them to do something. So you get discretionary effort as well. So we probably all experienced working with people like this who have high behavioral integrity, and they often inspire uh, us to, to do better. Um, so those are some of the thoughts that I had just in reaction. Bob, do you want to add anything? Um, yes, please. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a bit, a bit negative or realistic. Um, it's, it's so freaking hard man, to change behaviors. Um, the, the concept is simple, um, but uh, so the, 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 I, I agree with what Duncan said about um, the maturity part, in part. Um, so when's the right to start, time to start? Well, you know, it was probably um, 10 years ago uh, as well as now. Um, when's the best time to plant a tree and all that malarkey? But I worked on a horrendous project and we tried to, um, we, we, yeah, we tried to, educate um, some of the people in, in behavioral science and behavioral change, and this was for leadership. Um, and I, I never really understood this phrase until I was working with this company I was working for, but we were perfectly designed to be as crap as we were. Uh, and that, that is so true. You, with the performance you're getting at the moment, if it's good, um, you are perfectly designed to get that good performance. And the performance that you're getting, if it's not so good, you are perfectly designed to get that performance. And, and it takes a seismic amount of effort to get that to shift um, in, in, from, a, from a not so good place into a, a good place um, because everything is in support of what you are getting just now. Now, that kind of sounds, well, what, why, what the heck does that mean? Well, but if you take it back to some of the stuff that John was talking about, about behaviors um, um, being this, this thing, this change that happens at a local level um, because what people say and do, so behavior is, it's an action. I mean, many people don't even understand that behavior is as simple as what we say and do. And it's these things that happen on an on a hourly, well, minute by minute basis, actually, in an organization that give you the results you're getting. But it's all these actions and all these actions are perfectly designed to happen. And they're also, because we're um, creatures of habit and, and patterns, we love our little patterns and routine in our behavioral repertoire it's very difficult to break us out of these um, routines that we have and we perpetuate the performance that we're getting. Uh, so tomorrow will most likely, well, no, tomorrow's Saturday. So tomorrow won't be a repeat of today because we've got this cultural thing around Saturdays where it is different. There's a different um, environment that we'll go into. <laughs> Um, so it tomorrow's be, Friday, Bob. Oh, tomorrow's Friday. Sorry, in Scotland, <laughs> it's Saturday. Um, we only work a, a four-day week. See, I'm going to the pub tonight. Last last day of the before the lockdown. Sorry, back on track. Back on track. Um, so <laughs> my environment. Okay, next, another example. My environment will change after this when I'll be in the pub. So my behaviour will change. But if your environment at work is exactly the same as it was the day before, then expect your behaviours to be the same and expect your results to be the same. Um, it takes a lot of effort to change behaviour, um, to change behaviour in the long term. We can definitely change it in the short term and, and with initiatives. And if you look at why initiatives work, it's because they get a lot of um, uh, a focus in the very short term. But then, of course, the focus goes elsewhere and the behaviours weren't embedded and then behaviour goes back to this natural state. Now, um, John also said about leaders, leaders creating the environment. Well, I'd go one step further with, with that and say, actually, the industry that you're operating in creates the environment as well. So construction and manufacturing, nursing, healthcare are perfectly designed to be the way they are um, because of the industry pressures as well uh, uh, that are on those. Now, then you think, well, hang on a minute. I've, I've 
got some examples of some really good um, uh, uh, construction companies or well, maybe good teams within construction companies or good teams within nursing or, or manufacturing. So that's, that's where I think the best place to focus on um, is these finding these spots of um, really good um, teams, these enlightened um, managers or leaders that are managing to create pockets of successful uh, performance despite the industry that they're in or despite the, the, um, the other stuff that's going on around them, working out what they're doing and then getting the rest of the, the teams up to speed um, with that as well. Um, but it's hard. It takes a lot of effort and most people will not succeed in changing behavior. That, that is definitely the case, right? We shouldn't fluff it up as anything more because most people will give up. It's as hard as it is to get fit, as it is to get healthy, as it is to run a marathon, to go against the momentum that, the, that is already in the industry and the company. But it's definitely not impossible. Um, so small pockets of enlightened managers can make this, this difference to the company but we shouldn't, I don't think, expect um, everyone to be on board all at the same time um, because everybody's got all sorts of other things going on. Um, so you kind of need a, maybe a, a certain percentage of an organization to be on board. Uh, but this can change. So, you know, one day it might be me, the next day it might be Duncan, the next day it might be Tim or the next week or whatever. Um, and you, you don't need everybody to be singing the same tune, but you need a good selection of people um, to be pushing forward on things like the behavioral integrity, creating certainty within the business, creating trust within the business. Um, and, um, but the key drivers to, to actual behavior change have to happen at that local level from the environment impacting uh, onto the people themselves. Mm. Well, just, I see Kat's coming in with a second question, uh, next question, but can I just, uh, just follow on from what you're saying though before we move on? Uh, because you mentioned there that behaviour change isn't easy, and absolutely isn't, and it does take time. Uh, and one of the, uh, the the terms that I say is behaviour change is not a crisis tool. And uh, there's a number of times when uh, you can get called up somewhere because something's not working. So you go in there and sort it out with some of your behaviour change stuff. It does not work that way. It takes time. And um, and, and interestingly, from that point of view, something that um, I really don't like is a topic of the month type of approaches. Uh, uh, where where we have a particular issue, we do a topic of the month, and then we move on, uh, and it absolutely leads you know leads into the, what you were talking about about needing to embed change, uh, and uh, and even once it's embedded, something we forget to do is to make to look at how we're going to maintain it. What what's the maintenance regime around keeping a behaviour once you've got it? Uh, because I've recognised all all the time I've been in the construction industry, when we focus on a particular area, we can get it to be good. But when we stop focusing on it, it, it can often go back to how it was. So uh, it takes potentially years to get to a point where you really have developed the behavior that you want to, uh, on a particular area. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, and just to add on to that, that, that if I, I think you, if we view it as um, almost like an e evolution, right? So evolutionary um, in, in health and safety, we are improving, right? We're definitely improving. Um, the key is, can we improve faster than we would naturally just with the invention of better tools and better things and better stuff, you know? Can we speed up this kind of evolution? Um, can, we, can we be less accepting of some of the stuff that's going on and start to introduce more stuff that will actually make a difference? So speeding up that evolution, I think, is, is a good way of looking at it as well. Do, do you mind if I try and um, tie, tie some of these themes uh, together a little? Um, I, particularly the, I, the most important one we'll talk about tonight probably, which is trust, and tie that back to some of the methodologies. You know, I tried to say there were three strands, inspiration, observation, and analysis, like, you know, broadly. You know, and I think if you're genuinely analysis driven, you're not, you know, you're not going to go too far wrong, really. The trouble with the inspirational stuff is that quite often you can have somebody like Jason stand up there, make the whole room cry, and management stand at the back saying, well, that's done, you know, and it's a tick box exercise. And the same with observational, uh, uh, you know, behavioral safety. If it's done properly, you know, what and why properly, the right questions, listening in the right way, that's great. But often it can be a tick box exercise, head counts, uh, just going through the motions. And sometimes it can actually get quite blamey, you know, so not asking the question why curiously, they're asking it aggressively. And so, more things can go wrong with the observation and the inspirational stuff that can go wrong with a good analysis based program. And that's where the unions get upset and it, it, it all goes a bit, 
sideways and as you said right at the beginning bob you know some of it's a right mess out there you know so. yeah Tim, it was it was fantastic to hear you say that because when I when I've seen companies, you know, b before you and Jason joined forces, you know, think they had done something because Jason had been in, and and the impact when Jason talks, I've seen him several times, um, is is phenomenal, and and that was giving them this false sense of security, and then they would blame the worker even more. They'd say you've heard Jason, you know, and you still didn't do what you were meant to do, um, so it it was great to hear when when you guys teamed up, um, so you can have that awareness and then lead it into something else. Well, I mean, and that's what it needs to be, isn't it? You know, I, I'm going to get your attention at the end of this talk. You are going to volunteer to do something proactive and something constructive and something analytical. Uh, and and, and we'll, we'll drive forward from there. So it's, it's got to be part of a holistic piece. Yeah, and, and I, think, <laughs> I, I think that's a really good point because a lot of behavioral safety programs particularly focus a lot on trying to change attitudes um and uh, through these sort of things uh, and as we all know changing attitudes is phenomenally difficult anyway um and uh, and then we stop there it, it, it it's definitely got to be that point which is just that that initial kind of like push to move us on to what we do next so almost impossible to change attitudes look at the trump debate you know almost <laughs> everybody who watched that who was going to vote for trump is still going to there. vote for trump you know? <laughs> Sorry, John. <laughs> I'm going to mute. You just uh, invoked my PTSD. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, we'll move on to the next question. So, Tim, just before we do, can I just confirm with you what's the book that you're you're referencing? It's um, Mindset, the one that you've. You're on mute. You're on mute, Tim. Because <laughs> um, I was teasing John. Uh, Carol Dweck's mindset um, and it's all about being positive and you know you spend a lifetime learning everything's a learning opportunity constantly driving forward or you defensive and fatalistic yep. and, and the whole essence of it is you spend your whole life asking the question why did that happen okay now I understand that what am I going to do about it okay Go thank you that's it okay. yeah we'll share that one in the links for people if, uh, if anybody wants to have a look at that one I am um, okay so the Next question that I'm going to um, throw at you is, uh, do you find differences between manufacturing and construction or any sort of like different um, organizations or industries that you've worked with when implementing a behavior-based safety approach? And if so, can you provide us with any sort of examples of what sort of strategies or tools um, that you've used uh, that, uh, that, or the tools that seem to work best within different industries. Okay, guys, do you mind if I go? It's going to be brief, this one. Uh, no, no difference. <laughs> no, I, 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 think, I think a little bit more to that. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I've worked in, in, in across a few industries, um, construction and manufacturing and, and some other petrochemical stuff as well. Not, not managed to do much in, in, in healthcare yet. Um, and the, the similarities are, um, frightening, I guess, in um, in those industries, and the I think the reason is is because they are um, dealing with um, hierarchy, and the people at most at risk are the least paid, and there's a massive them and us gap, um, and I think this generates a, um, a massive misunderstanding from from management and leaders about what actually is going on and how hard it is is to do the job um, and therefore part of the strategy for improvement is hold, as gently as possible holding up some sort of mirror um, to the leaders and managers about what it's actually like to do the stuff that they're asking the guys and girls to do on the floor um, because that's, the, that's what I've come across as the biggest problem is this belief that they're doing something incorrect and the, the workers are just actually trying to do what they believe the managers and leaders are asking. And really the managing leaders have no clue what is actually happening out, out on site or, or in the factory floor. Yeah, yeah. just, to, just adding to that, Bob. Um, now I've spent my life uh, in construction ever since the day I was born, basically. Uh, but uh, within construction, I've worked in many different parts of it. And uh, I'd say, first of all, in terms of is it uh, certain industries where it would work better than others or it works differently than others, I would start by saying that people are people. Uh, and everything we're talking about here is about people. However, you do get some industries which do have very entrenched cultures which are very hard to break down. 
And uh, one, from my experience, one of those was um, the utilities, um, you know, uh, that were, were I, I used to call it, rightly or wrongly, the, the pipe in the ground approach, which is all about getting as much pipe in the ground as you can every day and, and very much targeted and bonused on those sort of things. Uh, and those sort of cultures are, are, are quite hard um, to, to actually move forward on. But the, the benefit that you can get in any of these cultures, uh, particularly sometimes those really entrenched ones, is just what, as you're saying, Bob, there, in terms of listening to the people who are doing the work. And not only listening to them, but actually allowing them to make some of the, well, to make the decisions. Um, and, and it links into, part of the question was, what tools uh, can work best? Tools that get people talking, frankly because that's what it's all about and it's okay to just tell people well start talking um you know and it'll work but uh certainly if you stand up in front of a room of people and say well tell me about whatever it is tell me about what's really a problem here where we really need to improve uh you'll probably not get a lot of conversation in there so you need some sort of tools uh, that, that get that get people talking and there's plenty out there certainly in in, in our business we use um we use some, uh, some 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 cards which which actually generate some ideas around uh, some conversations, and, and I know Bob uh, in Soldat you, you do have some conversation cards type of approach, and that and that talking, but not only talking, but genuinely taking on board what what people are saying um, at the at the workplace, I, I think is the tools that will work across any industry. Um, I'm, I might add uh, that uh, I, I do think there's a difference between manufacturing and construction, and I have no experience and no training in, in either. I'm a psychologist. <laughs> so, you know, my experience is through working with organizations that are, you know, do, uh, do manufacturing work or construction work. Um, and the difference that I've seen in trying to make change, create culture change and improve results um, is, uh, is primarily in that construction is more complex, I think, and more dynamic, right? So like, um, you know, you've got, in many cases, you've got different workers day to day on a single job um, where you don't have that in many cases in manufacturing. Uh, you've got a stable workforce and you've also got different jobs or different sites uh, from, from job to job. So one job ends, the next job starts, it's completely different than the last job. I mean, there are similar elements, but right, but there are differences, um, major differences that drive differences in safety. And the same thing doesn't happen in manufacturing as much. And so I think that added level of complexity is, uh, makes it much more difficult in construction. In fact, I, I was told that, um, who's the guy that wrote the lean book? Was it Womack? Um, he was famous for saying like, construction will never be able to use lean <laughs> for that reason, right? Because it's just so dynamic and changing. Um, so, so that brings me to the tools. The first is leadership. And I think that in construction, leadership is even more important if that's possible than in manufacturing because of these changing environments. So like day to day on a site, you need site leadership to be setting clear expectations and having those discussions regularly and artfully with new people coming week to week. And, and the people who are managing the people who manage those sites uh, need to be equally good, but uh, with different skills, right? Because those sites and the jobs change over time and the expectations may change over time, right? So like that is a, that's a strain on leadership, um, that, that dynamic environment. And so I think leadership has to be much better. I was also gonna say conversations. I've used Bob's conversation cards and you guys on here like a shameless plug, you really should get them. They're super, they're cheap, but they're really in a nice box. And they're like, they're funny and they're interesting. And I give them to supervisors and leaders, even directors all the time, because I say, go have a conversation. And they're like, if they're honest with me, they'll say, well, what am I gonna say? I'm like, well, here, take this box and just randomly pick a card and say that, right? <laughs> Um, even with that, though, we found that, I mean, I find myself teaching courses on conversations frequently. Yeah, there you go. So I think you can get them on the SODAC website. And I think even Amazon UK has them. We'll, I'll find a link and I'll put it in there. Um, the other two tools are also, I also learned from Bob. Uh, and the first one is uh, this idea of calculating at risk and reduced risk. And this is different than doing a behavioral observation. Um, but Bob has some really nice explainer videos. It is super simple 
on how to do this. Um, and maybe Bob, you can put a link to one of your videos in the, in the chat if, if you could, because this has been hugely helpful in construction companies that I've worked for, construction organizations, because any of the trades can do it, a superintendent can do it, anyone can do it, a foreman, and all the, it involves just walking around and looking at each person and each situation and, and just ticking, are they at risk potentially for any reason? And, or are they reduced risk? That is, they're doing everything as safely as they can, but you're still on a construction site, so you're not like safe, you're at your reduced risk, right? So like that, and then you're not writing names down, you're not writing causes, you're not diving into it, you're not even having conversations unless someone's in imminent danger. You're just collecting some data because the question for everybody on this uh, call, I think is like, let's bring us back to the everyday here and what's important, how safe are your sites? right now like whether i don't care what industry you're in could you tell me how safe your site is that you have responsibility for and if you say yes i'll say well all right well give me a number and you can't typically <laughs> right because you may have behavior-based safety observations which are, which are notoriously you know um in like inaccurate um or you may have audit information which is going to be dated but this is something you could just walk the site and you could have it done multiple times a day. So at risk, reduced risk. And then the last one is uh, the behavioral incident analysis toolkit that Bob has uh, created. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I wouldn't say these things if I don't love them and use them myself with my own clients. It, it's, it's super cool. It's a game board. Whenever you know, any non-conforming event happens, you could, you could use it and do an analysis on, on that thing. It causes you to ask the right questions and understand the factors that might be driving the behavior. I strongly recommend it to anyone who wants to, who's interested in changing behavior in that analysis piece that Tim has referred to. It's a really good guide and you don't even have to have very much training at all to do it. So I'll shut up. Tim. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I, mean, I want to agree with the, the other speakers, of course. There's a lot of synergy tonight, I think. Um, and the first thing is to, to agree with Bob, you know. Um, no, not really. Um, and Trevor Kletz, I think, wasn't it, who said, you know, the terrible sameness of accidents. When you look at accidents, they all have the same root cause. And, and the, the methodology, uh, to, to pick up on Duncan, that I think is absolutely key is, is the classic safety differently question, you know, which is, OK, um, I want you to work safely and, and profitably. You probably want to work safely and profitably. What do you need from me? You know, um, and, I, and I think in some industries, uh, particularly, let's say, construction, um, in some industries, the answers to those questions can be particularly challenging and difficult to hear. Um, and, and, and that's it. So in terms of the methodology, the methodology stays the same, but sometimes the complexity and difficulty and the way we're structured, you know, as Bob said before, we are geared up to deliver exactly what we're about to deliver. That's, that's, that's a taken, taken as given. And sometimes the answers to those good questions are really difficult for people to do things with, um, I, I think. But, uh, you know... That's, 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 I'll, I'll shut up there on that. I know we, we're, we're running out of time now as we hit seven o'clock, I think. Isn't it? So can, can I uh, just, well, I think we're working till, we're going till half seven, aren't we, on this one? I think, yeah. Got uh, a few more questions to go yeah. yet, Duncan, I think. <laughs> I might be able to just pick, just pick up on a point that, that, that uh, both Tim's made there and, and John's made, though, in terms of complexity. Uh, and uh, there's more than just construction that has complexity and change, but it, it certainly is uh, an industry where change is every minute. And uh, again, to me, this comes down to giving the account of, well, to, to giving the uh, ability to the people who are doing the work to make the decisions. Uh, and something that has often irked me re regarding um, regarding what we say and the message we're giving construction, it's a difficult one, is if something changes, stop and go and speak to your supervisor, get the risk assessment rewritten, so on and so forth. And I think this is really inhibiting the potential of the, of the people we have working for us. The people, and I'll go back to saying that the people that work for us know what they're doing, and we need to give them the tools and, and, and the confidence to make many of the decisions themselves. Because if we actually did, you know, if we actually did stop, every time something changed, we would never actually get going. So we're actually constantly using the adaptability of the people that work for us to actually keep on going. And we need to embrace that in, in instead of trying to inhibit it. Yeah, I mean, the point I was trying to make, Duncan, I think, is that you know, whether it's construction or any other industry that's difficult, uh, the answer to the question, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that unsafe thing? Why are you taking those risks? And the answer is, because I work for you, you idiot. You know? and, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> Sorry. Yeah, should we shut up now and let the next question come? <laughs> Right, thanks, gents. Okay, so we've got another question here. How do you blend behavioural based safety with the usual safety approaches practised by most industries at the moment? Is there a balance or each approach works differently? There's been a, a few sort of general questions along that along those lines. So who would like to start with that one? Can we throw in safety two into this uh, response too? Because I saw of course, that yep. I want to hear what you guys have to say about that. It's kind of selfish. I mean, in my view, I'll start off because mine's kind of simple, I think. Um, uh, you know, I, I look at things from a scientific perspective. You know, understanding the science of behavior um, tells you that all of these things have their value. And you understand why they work uh, when they work, and you understand why they don't work when they don't work. That, that's, that's why, uh, you know, what I, I, don't, I don't actually implement behavior-based safety programs myself. I, I used to in the 90s, but... But instead now I've learned that teaching leaders at all levels in the organization uh, as much about behavior as I can allows them to spot it everywhere and decide on their own which elements are most effective and which aren't and fix the ones that need fixing. So I don't know, man, I think people talk, make a big deal about BBS and behavioral science being different from safety differently. I'm not an expert in safety differently, but my view is that they seem completely uh, to go together to me. But you give me just about anything and I guess I can understand how it fits with behavior since you know I, I'm coming at it from a behavioral science perspective. What do the rest of you guys think? Okay, um, so I, I agree. Um, the, so for me, behavioral science, learning behavioral science allowed me to see how to um, make the intention work of, of, of stuff that we've got. So the, the intention in a lot of the, if you want to call them traditional safety things, is correct. The intention in, in all of this stuff is, is correct. It's to, to help prevent injury. Um, but behavioral science or having knowledge about behavioral science and how humans work then allows you to then say, well, hang on, but the way we're doing it isn't going to make a difference. So everything from um, the way that, that we might do a, um, a briefing on site or develop a safe system of work or whatever. If you understand actually how humans work, you would do it in a different way than perhaps we've got into the habit of doing it in, in most companies. Um, I'm, I'm not though a, a fan of a, a pocketed approach that, that and, and I don't even class behavioral science as a pocketed approach. I class behavioral science as an understanding of behavior that can be applied to anything. Um, so to me, behavioral science isn't even a program. It's, a, it's an understanding um, that you then implement onto other things. Whereas it sounds like to me that the kind of safety differently philosophy and that kind of thing is a, is a way of doing stuff. Um, it's, it's like a program. Now, I, 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 uh, I like a lot of stuff in, uh, of what I've heard about it, um, but I think there's a danger if you think that you just end up applying it because it sounds like you could miss a lot of other stuff that is there. There's nothing wrong with a risk assessment if it's done properly. There's nothing wrong with a method statement if it's done properly. You don't need um, safety whatever to tell you um, or, or to, to, to work on top of that to make it work. What you need to do is make it work. Um, and behavioral science can help you make it work because it can help you understand people. It would help you understand that if you just brief the guy on the risk assessment, then all you've done is your behavior of briefing. It means nothing else is going to happen. Something else might happen, but then you understand that it probably won't and you have to do other things to make the actual behavior happen. Um, so I think for me, and, and yes, I'm slightly biased because um, one of the reasons I love behavioral science is it's so mechanical and engineering like, and that was my background before doing this. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's measurable. Once you define a behavior in the way it's defined in behavioral science, every single behavior is measurable. Um, whereas a lot of the other stuff on, on behavioral safety programs, if you like, is, is the fluffier um, stuff that isn't so measurable. Um, so yeah, to me, behavioral science is the foundation um, that can help you get all this other stuff right, whatever it is, but I'm biased. Okay, uh, that, that, that leaves me, I think. And uh, you know, my, my, my take on this is, you know, when you look at organizational cultures, you've got really three things that you're looking at. The first one is your systems and procedures. Have you hit diminishing returns with, with that? 
um, and how do we make sure we understand what's going wrong. James Reason's golden rule number one of human error, even the best people make mistakes, so we've got to be aware of the fact that mistakes are inevitable. Hopkins, of course, you know, saying that all organisations are full of errors and holes. Uh, the, more, the best ones are proactively finding out what they are, the weaker ones are waiting for them to, the problems to, to, to find them. You know, and, and so there's, there's always has to be a process of learning and learning. You know, and, and yesterday we were doing some training online um, and we were, call, hit, we were calling it HIT training. Um, you could call it lean training, scrum training, behavioral root cause analysis training. But it's, it's a constant process of saying, look, holes are popping up in Reason's Cheese model all the time as we go forward dynamically. We need a proactive process of trying to spot what they are as we go forward. So, uh, you know, however that is. And then, and then, of course, the other element of a strong culture, as well as learning, is, is empowerment. And that's empowerment through great, great leadership. And we're talking about that constantly you now. It's the questions that we ask, the way we listen to the answers, the expectations we have in our, in our head, our understanding of human error and why people make mistakes. So that we're asking the right questions of the right people in a way that inspires them to get involved and get empowered. Um, so everything is interlinked, you know, and, and this whole safety one, safety two thing is, is, you know, I mean, the worst question I've been asked in the last 10 years at a conference was, are you safety one or safety two? And uh, apparently you're not allowed to punch people at conferences, but uh, if, if, if we were, you know. Um, and, and so it's trying to put you labels totally on things, I think, it isn't helpful, you know. Tim, Tim, if you come to the U.S., you can totally punch people at conferences. It's fine. Oh, great. It's encouraged. <laughs> So just picking up on that, the question related as well to uh, how do you blend uh, a behavioural safety programme or, or whatever into your existing processes? And uh, not surprised I'm going to no, agree. Sorry, Doug, I, I yeah. should have said more clearly, if, if it isn't automatically blended, you're not doing it right. Indeed. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think this is exactly it, Tim. I, I, it certainly should not be an add-on. And uh, a number of us have talked about having behavioural programmes. And, and, and I must admit, I still do deliver behavioral programs, but more and more, um, it, it's, it's more important to be teaching people the skills to be able to understand what needs to change for themselves and be able to, to make that change happen rather than having behavioral programs. And therefore, uh, it does depend to some on, on the maturity of your organization. And, and we started out right at the beginning of this um, at this webinar talking about BBS and some of the criticisms around BBS. Well, frankly, I would say 20 or 30 years ago, it worked for some organizations. Uh, but, you know, as a society and, and in our work environment, things change uh, and, and culture changes. And the danger is when we don't change with that. Uh, and uh, BBS, in the way that it certainly was applied 20 or 30 years ago in the UK, really wouldn't work now. Uh, in terms of the what people's expectations at work uh, and um, from that point of view I, I think this whole behavior change point of view pulls on all of these elements that we're talking about whether it be safety one and two uh, and, uh, and of course uh, I, I guess the answer from safety one and which which are you safety one or safety two is hopefully both um, and a few others besides um, but uh, th there are so many labels being thrown out there now that I think we've got to be careful around this uh, the, the, the behavioral science that Bob talks about and I, and I use the language of behavior change but I think it's pretty much the same thing is about pulling in on, on any of the tools that are going to help us to actually uh, facilitate the right behaviors. Duncan which, which book were you just referring to? Did I mention a book then? Um, I'm not sure I did. I, I was talking, what did I think? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said uh, the, the, the safety that your book is referring to. Or, so um, so um, I, I don't think I mentioned the book, but what I was saying there is in terms of behavioral programs, um, so I certainly still deliver behavioral programs, but uh, I'm coming more and more to, to, to the training people with the right skills. And in terms of safety one and safety two, it, it's a case of, you, you're, uh, you shouldn't be one or the other, you're both, uh, uh, along with many, many other things as well. Yeah, and, and just, just to add to that, I think we will get to a stage where, well, well, at some point where it's not even a safety program, it's just the program. It's not safety culture, it's the culture. You know, it's this, there shouldn't be this distinction. There shouldn't be a safety strategy and a business strategy because they're just competing. You just have one strategy, you have one culture. 
Well, uh, particularly as we get into the world of well-being and mental health now, you know. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, you know, define harm uh, and. <laughs> You know, and the, the fact that, you know, we lose 50 people to suicide to every person we lose in the UK to an accident and, and far more than that to health issues. You know, the, the more and more we understand this is a holistic piece and uh, just stopping people falling down the stairs is just base one. Yeah. And, and that integrated approach, and I'm sorry, I'm going to be the first one in, in the webinar to mention COVID-19. Terrible thing. Why have I mentioned that? But anyway, but there's something to learn from that in the terms of certainly I've seen in, in the construction environment that when we're planning works now, we're absolutely planning by integrating how we're going to do the work safely into that, which is something we, we often separate the two. We say, well, we, we separate safety planning and actually doing the work. Uh, and, and I see real, some real learnings in some of the things that we've done in terms of uh, in communicating in, uh, and in terms of planning our approach to individual tasks. Yeah. I, I might just also add that, uh, you know, to Bob's point of, um, you know, saying uh, there's the safety strategy versus business strategy, they should be the same. Mm. It should be how we do everything. I think there's another question on here that I've, that I've noticed about applying behavioral safety toward DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think the same goes there, right? Like th there's nothing that is um, in concept from a scientific perspective, not a values perspective, but from a scientific perspective, there's nothing that's different about DEI than there is about safety. You can specify behaviors that correspond to that and you can create an environment where you're more likely to get it. If you, uh, if, if you can, if you know what you're looking for and you talk about it and you give feedback and you create, create the conditions for it. Um, in fact, uh, I was just asked to be involved with a major grant from the, U from the U.S. Um, uh, involving in several universities where they're looking at um, improving uh, DEI and reducing discrimination in health centers across the country from a leadership perspective. It's like, what can leaders do to promote this and reduce discrimination, discrimination and racism? in these, in these uh, often low-income environments. Um, and it's totally something that we could do. I mean, it's, again, it's a leadership, it's a cultural issue, it's a, you know, it's a behavioral issue. Okay. We'll let you in now, Kat. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so this might end up being like the, the second last question. I'm not sure uh, how we're gonna get on. So. Um, a question to each of you. So can you share some of your, your own, your personal examples of successful implementation of behavioral safety campaigns uh, that have proven results? So campaigns that you've been involved in with different companies. I'll, I'll, I'll take that first because I'll try and keep it short if I can. Um, at the beginning, I talked about Chap UK uh, back in the 1990s. Um, and even though I was incredibly naive in the methodologies I suggested, all sorts of goal setting and feedback and all sorts of stuff that we consider quite sophisticated these days, um, it worked splendidly. It was an IOSH case study for, for many years in, in the brochures. They're outdated now. But the brochures that were around 20 years ago where they were front and centre, you know, they, they cut their accident rate to a tenth of what it had been. Um, and, the, and the reason was because Neil and Vince wanted it to happen they really wanted it to happen unfortunately because of the classic reason of going to a funeral uh, talking to the widow um you know and ideally it would be based on win-win um and a proactive uh, a knowledge that you know all sorts of good things happen if you get your culture right but this is the old-fashioned way of, of of getting the motivation but it was the management commitment that was absolutely central you know um and that, that would be my case study of, of you know that the, the you know, we, we all know that if you if you're wheeled in as a tick box, um, as, as a tick box consultant who's just going to, to, to fill in some forms and and make the company look good, you're not going to get very far. You know, um, we, we all know that. So that, that's that's my case. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, so uh, I guess I'm going to say the, uh, the, 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 the approach that we use now in the organization I'm in uh, is probably the one I'm most proud of in terms of its benefits. And that's because it's orientated around those doing the work, making more of the decisions and all the tools are, are, are around that. Uh, but what I'd like to do is kind of like take, turn the question slightly and say, it's, it's not necessarily a program where, where I see uh, the, the greatest success. It's individual 
uh, circumstances and individual conversations. And the thing that I see and I like most is when I get people ringing me up or pulling me over and saying, come and have a look at what we've done here, Duncan. We've done a great job here. What do you think about it? And that's that discretionary effort that John was talking about, that if you get your culture right, if you get your trust right, uh, and really believe in the people that are doing the work, that's when you get the best results. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree, Duncan. And, you know, some, sometimes I call myself the worst, the worst salesman ever. Often I say this, and I'm about to say it again with my description here, but I've probably helped more individuals than I have companies. <laughs> I think um, some of the, some of the individuals that come that come back as well that, that have been through the stuff we do and they've applied it at home um, or to their personal life and it's made a, such a massive difference to to how they've how they've started to see the world and life um, uh, it, it has been remarkable and and actually it's far more rewarding as well because they're actually people of course um, but the, the when when companies have um, implemented it and, um, and, and made a difference. It's, it's always centered around uh, the, the tying it up with doing something different, right? Which, and that sounds like, well, what the hell is that? Okay, so it's back to that kind of thing way back at the start that I said is you have to say and do something different on a daily basis. Um, and you have to have some sort of idea before you do that about what that's gonna achieve, but expect it to achieve nothing and then be really surprised when it does achieve something. Um, and then measure it um, as well before and after your intervention to see if it's made a difference. Um, and as they say in Scotland, many a meekle makes a muckle. Um, uh, so many, as John's like, what the hell is he talking about? Um, so many a small change makes a, makes a big massive change. It really does. And, but if you try and tackle, it's, it's the same thing as eat the elephant one bite at a time. If you, the, the biggest successes we've had of where we've had individual site agents or, or um, managers, workers, supervisors that have really taken it on board. Sometimes it's, it's the, the same as Tim was saying from, from a fatality or whatever, or losing a friend, um, and then really pushing it through with, with the tools. We, we've given the tools to some people and they've done nothing with them. You know, so it's, it's not the tools, it's the, it's the, the, I guess it's the passion and motivation themselves behind the tools that then again rubs off on other people that work around them as well that then provide this kind of measurable um, difference but it it centers around doing something different and I, and I, I, I can't emphasize how important that is that they actually have to do something different you know it's they can't just stick folk on courses um, and actually we've turned work down when people have said can you come in and uh, actually it was it was um it was a utility company, uh, actually, Duncan, back to your pipe layers. It was a cable or fiber optic company. And they said, these guys are just going through all these cables. Can you come and do some behavioral safety with them to stop them going through all the cables? And I'm like, what, the workers? And I'm like, no, we don't, we, don't, we don't really work with the workers. I'll take all your supervisors. No, I won't take, I'll take your man. No, I'll take your leaders. Give us your leaders and we'll do something with your leaders. No, no, but it's the workers I need fixed. And, and we ended up just not doing any work with them because they were adamant they wanted a number of workshops done, bums on seats. Um, and that's just not how, how sustainable behavior change happens anyway. You have to start um, uh, and, and continue to support the people that actually create the, the contingencies within the company. Um, I, I will, um, I just, um, these are great answers. Uh, there's so much to say on term, in terms of case studies. I'm kind of a data guy. Um, so I'm going to, I put in um, to the, to the um, chat two uh, resources for you guys. One is from a, a free download from my website with 500 case studies from um, us teaching behavioral leadership in manufacturing to improve safety. Um, in fact, it resulted in, um, we haven't published it because uh, I, I have a different uh, motivations these days. I, I enjoy working with clients more than publishing anymore. Um, but, uh, but we did publish a part of one of them and that's in Safety Science. Um, and I put that link in there as well. And if you can't get the article, write to me and I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, but you know, what we found is that when you teach people behavioral science in an effective way and you lead them to take a step, like what Bob's saying, and it's important how I'm saying this, you lead them to take a step in the right direction, and then you create an environment that reinforces those steps that they've taken, you will pretty soon and very surprisingly rapidly see massive change in the organization if they start saying and doing the right things. So there's a lot there, right? Um, but when you see the outcomes, if you look at that case study, you'll see 
that you know the half of the company that that worked with us and learned this had the same safety support same resourcing and everything we even matched them for size of site and and uh and amount of production and uh and the ones that learned behavioral safety leadership reduced their injuries twice as much as the rest of the company like this is within a company uh within a country right so like um you know it, to it totally works so um so here's the thing i'm imagining in my in my me being in your place listening to all this and you're thinking like well what the hell do i do now um well uh I i'll say that it's not enough to say be empathetic or be a good listener or take the first step or any of those trite cliches right like that won't change your behavior what you could do is i'll give you a very concrete thing that you might that you might do and i'd love to hear this from the rest of the group too like what's the concrete thing that people could do next so i would suggest pull your team together and 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 tell them to take out a sheet of paper and write down what frustrates them about work about life about whatever and start there because a lot of times people's passion negative passion uh can be used uh to you know for good right you don't want to do that forever uh but you, and you've got to turn that energy into something positive and proactive but that that could be a first step that could get you pointed in the right direction because you might learn something and it, as part of our courses we we will have people do that and then there's a whole series of steps that you'll do after that as well right like you want to talk about them you want to address them you want to thank them for doing that and so forth but that would be a first concrete step thank you very much okay so we've got one we've got time for one quick question um to get a quick answer from from all the panelists um so we'll go with have you had any ethical issues around this area and how did you address those so if we start with bob i'm glad you picked an easy one for the, <laughs> the quick last one Cheesy peeps. Ethical issues around this. Um, well, so, I mean, goodness, I, I don't, I'm trying to guess what's in the person's head that's asked this question because I'm not entirely clear. Ethical issues in, in, in adopting a BBS or using behavioral science? Well, I mean, you can use behavioral science um, uh, techniques to get anything to happen, right? So just teaching people behavioral science isn't, doesn't give you the moral direction of how you should use it. Okay, um, and actually, if you look at very successful dictators, bullies, um, um, narcissists, um, Donald Trump, etc., they're very good at um, manipulating behaviours, and and maybe took a course. Um, who knows? Um, actually, if you've watched the Social Dilemma, you'll you'll have heard on there that most of the guys took B.J. Fogg's course, um, who's a, a master at habit change and and psychology and behavioural science as well. And that's how they learned to create such successful manipulating platforms. Um, also, if you watch that as well, you realize the like button on Facebook was the idea was that it was just about sharing love um, rather than actually all the, the, the downsides that an unintended consequence that has happened. That's often the case too, that things that you end up trying or implementing at work or at home have unintended consequences because we're we're not good. We're not, we're not supercomputers. One of the reasons, you know, we still even find it difficult to predict the weather is because there's so many variables involved, but at some point there, that even the weather will be able to be predicted because we'll be that good. Human behavior is kind of similar. Um, it's definitely um, mechanical and we could have a great debate on determinism and free will as well. Um, but there's so many variables and our wee brains can't handle the amount of variables, but we've got a good handle on, on enough of it to make predictions, but we should always expect those predictions to perhaps be incorrect and observe what happens after the intervention to see if what we want it to happen is what we want it to happen. And if it's not, then, then change the intervention. But you definitely need that kind of moral compass on top of the, the use of the tools as well, I, I would say. Okay. I, I'm glad you had to go first on that, Bob. <laughs> Just very quickly, uh, you, uh, you asked for a quick answer. So from my point of view, I thought to try to understand the, the question. Uh, from an ethical point of view, it, it's interesting because sometimes behavioral safety can, can, and behavior change can be seen as manipulating people's behavior, and that's not what it's about. However, if you look at um, it's something that the, the behavioral insights team uh, 
uh, have um, wrestled with a little bit because they do a lot of nudging, nudging people into the right behaviours. And a lot of time that is about manipulating people's behaviours uh, in terms of uh, the, the, one of the classic examples that's given is, uh, is that default into... Um, default into a workplace pension rather than choosing to get one or not. And that, that is absolutely manipulation. But I guess to some extent, uh, you've got to look at the benefits behind what you're trying to achieve as well. Oh, okay, uh, that's that, that's me. I think, oh, oh yeah, we are running out of time. Um, yeah, uh, l luckily, uh, in terms of ethics, you know, where if you if all your methodologies you'd be trying to sell, I mean, obviously, as consultants, we're trying to sell things, but if they're all geared squarely at uh, objective analysis and they're all geared at um, empowerment uh, of the workforce, you know, you haven't got too many ethical issues there, really. Um, you know, uh, well, you, I, I know what you're after. You're after a, a, a little story or something. And and uh, w w one example, I did Steelworks once where, the, uh, the manager, CEO, kept saying, it's not us, it's the workforce, you got to go out there and fix them. Um, and I remember sitting there thinking, either I take this guy on or I, uh, I shut up and take the money. Um, and I, I hope you'd be pleased to know that I gave him a few choice observations um, and uh, didn't take any money at all, obviously, because uh, that was the last time I was invited back there. But frankly, he was an idiot, so what can you do? <laughs> I've been and, in and, and, and they've gone bankrupt since, so I wasn't completely wrong. <laughs> anyway, moving on, sorry. I think that's a great example though, Tim. I mean, for us, we're put in that position all the time. Do I tell the truth or not? And you can see it very clearly, right? Like I've been in that position many times. Sometimes it works out as you've said, and sometimes they thank you for it, right? Like, because they realize that that's what they need. Um, you know, so um, I think that's our ethical responsibility is to be honest and respectful. Um, and I think that the same goes for people at work um, with their coworkers. It, the ethics comes in to, you know, where, you know, when you're, when you're being dishonest, when you're being manipulative in some way, um, or you're asking people to do something that uh, is dishonest or illegal or in some way, you know, against the values of the company, right? So keeping, keeping in mind what's best for this individual keeps us on the straight and narrow path, I think. And, th and that's the way this technology should be used. If it's used otherwise, it's very clear that people will, uh, you know, work against you and they will find a way to like, to dismantle what you've done. I mean, that's just the way people are. We're ingenious at doing that. So. Yeah. But what, what this guy said was, um, I don't need anything. I don't need to teach me anything about organizational culture. I know everything there is to know about organizational culture. And my question was, well, if, if that's the case, how come you're so crap then? <laughs> I'll, I'll get my coat. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm going to have to step in here. We, we are fast running out of time. Um, I could listen to this conversation all night. There's so much information coming from uh, the, the panelists this evening. The, the, the questions coming in as well. We have so many. In fact, there's, a, there's another 17 questions on here that remain unanswered at the moment. <clears throat> I think if the panelists are okay with that, what I'd like to do is probably collate these questions at the end. And um, if anybody uh, has the opportunity to, to, to answer these, we can certainly send them out to to the, uh, the wider audience, if that's okay, and if everybody's comfortable with participating in that. Um, okay, so just to wrap things up, I do have one final uh, question for you all, and it's a 30-second question, really. Um, and it's really, you know, everything we spoke about tonight, and, and considering the audience that we've got here this evening, what are your top three pieces of advice that you can give everyone to take away and possibly develop um, the behavioral safety within their own organizations. Let's start with Bob. Okay, right. As, as if by magic and as if I prepared. Um, so the, the, <laughs> um, don't assume you know what went on, right? And this is the pre to the three, right? Pre to the three. Don't assume you know what went on, but do assume that the person who got injured was one, trying to achieve something for the company, two, did not intend to get injured, three, had done it that way before on multiple times. Thanks, Bob. Tim? So, um, well, my, my three would be um, Read Black Box Thinking by Matthew Saeed. 
Uh, the best book about safety in the last 30 years, all about the vital importance of learning. Also read his book, Bounce, which is all about the Heinrichs principle of you get the luck that you deserve on, on balance. Um, feed that through some stuff on holistic um, human error um, and, uh, and empower the workforce best you can. Yeah. Um, having come, come up with methodologies that do that, having read those books and, and some of the stuff on holistic. So. Perfect. Thanks very much, Tim. John? I would say uh, first, first thing is get a coach. Um, and uh, I mean, I, it sounds self-serving because I'm a coach and these others uh, on the panel also are. But in truth, uh, you know, there's study of how do you learn something as quickly as possible? And you can learn any skill in 20 hours to a very high degree uh, if you start with a coach. And you, and you follow a few other steps, right? But like, that's number one. I would get somebody who, can, who will tell you the truth, who you trust, who is observant and knows their behavioral stuff uh, so that they can uh, have honest conversations with you. Um, I would, secondly, I would ask more questions and learn more about how to ask a good question. I got a book when I got interested in this, and I, it's too far away right now to show you, but um, I'll try to get the title real quick. It's got 1,800 questions in this book that leaders can ask. Right. <laughs> I was like, there are that many. I didn't know. Um, so being curious and asking questions is, is key. And then third is learn as much as you can about behavioral science. Do that by reading. There's podcasts, there's book, there's audio books. There, there are many, many resources. I, if you go to my website and the ones that I put up, Dom Cooper's I put up earlier too, um, has tons of uh, resources. I know Tim Marsh on his website, he's got tons of resources as well. And so does Bob. Like there's tons of free stuff. There's no excuse for not learning more. So I, those are my three. Thanks, John. And finally, Duncan. So I'm going to give you one to, to finish off, um, <clears throat> which is listen to the people that are doing the work and give them the opportunity to actually make, make a difference. But when you're listening to them, by actually genuinely wanting to know what the answer is. Perfect. Thanks, Duncan. Um, just well, we've got something finally in the chat um, from Tim Carr. Uh, Tim Marsh, could you uh, provide the titles of the books that you just referenced again? Nice oh, and sure. Um, can... Black Box Thinking and Bounce by Matthew Saeed. The man who's on the radio is the ping pong player. He's a former ping pong player. But uh, the, the, those two are incredibly readable, full of fantastic case studies about Mozart and David Beckham and God knows what. Um, but, but absolutely about the fundamentals of excellence. Yeah. You're muted, Andy. Andy, you're muted. <laughs> I'm on mute now. So yeah, just to wrap things up, we, we've run over just by a few minutes. Um, thank you very much to all the panelists for joining us this evening. Um, I think it's, it's really been a, a good open discussion. I think there's been a lot of learning that's been had out of this. So I've just got one thing to say to, to everybody here, and that's, you know, thank you very much for your time and participating with the, uh, the IOSH Northeast of Scotland branch. Uh, last but not least as well, um, I think at the peak we had well over um, 160 participants with us this evening. So I, I really do hope it's useful. Thanks very much for, for all coming along and joining this evening and, and supporting this. And, I hope it's been beneficial to everybody. So just on one final note, thank you very much, guys. <laughs> so listen, guys, thanks very much. Appreciate that. And uh, last but not least, Kat and Rachel, are you there? Thank you very much. You've been superb co-hosts this evening. Um, it's been absolutely fantastic. So. Hopefully, uh, we, we, we can drive this forward in the future. We're looking maybe at a part two and a part three to this, uh, maybe some more panellists as well in the future. Um, so again, thank you very much from the Irish North East of Scotland. Thank you. You're very Take welcome. Take care, everybody.